All right, here we go. Another True Brew Bobcast here at the end of Detente Road in Youngsville, Louisiana. Special guest, Mr. Kobe Crenshaw. How you like that coffee, Kobe Crenshaw? Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I can't believe there's no sweetener in it. I know. Isn't that neat? That is. Thank you. You really got this down, Bob. Well, look, we can talk about a hundred things with Kobe, but y'all don't run off. We're going to talk about the whole energy situation going on right now. It sounds boring, but it's awesome. So y'all just kind of kind of hang around, and uh, we'll get Kobe to try to make a little sense of this uh, whole energy situation in the uh, the globally, but also in the United States. So. Kobe, I don't know where we can start with this subject. I'm going to kind of move this kind of right here, but uh, <clears throat> big, big topic, big broad. Topic. So, so let's, let's kind of broad stroke if, if you don't mind. And let's talk about why, why has the big oil companies been villainized and is it a United States villainization or is it a global deal? So let's kind of start with a big broad stroke. Right. So I think the, <clears throat> the European and for the most part, North American energy companies, uh, sorry, oil and gas companies have been more villainized. Um, and that is uh, not sure why, but evidently it was maybe good politics for some groups or whatever. But but I think um, there is such a disconnect on what all goes on. First of all, it's a wonderful industry, and I think it's a great time to be in it. But it's a, it, there's a lot that goes on from the wellhead to... The outlet, right? There's a elaborate whole, on that. Like, yes. like people think of oil and gas, they think of gas in their car, right? But what really goes into right. it? Well, and 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 maybe maybe even if we got further than the gas in the car, and we did the flip the switch, right? Right. So when you just flipped on that switch, perfect example. Someone assumes that uh, everything is is electric. And uh, there's there's maybe uh, somewhere there's some magic happening, uh, but what what happens is we just went through a cord that just connected to a small power line that probably went through a transformer, went to a bigger power line, it went to a plant, and at that plant, uh, power generation plant, something was fueling it. And in this area, uh, you can imagine that there's a mix of a little bit of nuclear. A lot of natural gas and probably uh, some coal somewhere in this grid. But uh, s then you follow the fuel source. And by following those, um, you do have Norco that's a nuclear plant on this, this grid. But if you follow the fuel, then you're going to get to somewhere where there's a wellhead, there was a pipeline, um, somebody did a lot of work to get down to the fuel source deep. And that's, that's where it gets, uh, people forget about that. I always use the example, since energy uh, seems a little complicated, I always use the example of the beef in the butcher shop. And if you're in New York City, for example, and you want a steak or a hamburger, you may think that the beef comes from the butcher shop. But really, there was a, a train that probably delivered the beef. There is a kill plant or processing plant. And then before that, there is a, a right. ranch or feedlot. And so there's all those different steps. Um, but our average uh, user of electricity just thinks he flips a switch or just goes to the to the uh, to the butcher shop right no that's fair and um and that's that's part of this conversation right here is to sort of put some color on it um also besides the fuel that runs the generators that gives us electricity everything you name from from that outlet to 
a vehicle. Explain how much petrochemical goes in a vehicle. I think right. me and you had that conversation. Right. So in, in a vehicle itself, let's let's besides the fuel, let's look at uh, the tires. Let's look at the dashboard that's plastic, the glass, which could be a polyfilm type glass, or it could be glass. Incredible amounts of energy was used to make glass because you're taking sand and you cook it to a high, high, high temperature. Um, you've got your paint, you've got carbon fibers, you've got the foam in your seats, probably vinyl seats, maybe they're leather. Um, we can go on and on, but it's basically one big hydrocarbon. And you have it fueled. That's an electric EV hybrid and, of course, a combustion-type vehicle. That's it. So just look in your kitchen in your house, and, and you're going to see just tons of hydrocarbon. And look, let's take it away from things, too. I was reading uh, or uh, watching something on Rockefeller the other day, how he transitioned all of that to pharmaceuticals or right. anything in the synthetic umbrella. Yes. There, there's really nothing on us right now. Um, there's nylon threads. I think I got some poly in these pants. Uh, the stitching on, on my, my boots. Um, we've got uh, your glasses, the buttons on our shirt, um, what's in my wallet, an iPhone, you know, uh, yeah. you name it. The credit cards. Right. It's, it's all hydrocarbon Based so products. let's go back to the villainization a second, and what's 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 what the 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 cre the anger let's call it anger of of the planet. So, um, is it fair to say that global warming, them you know people politicians blaming the oil companies about global warming is like saying all the drug addicts blaming the poppy farmer? Yeah. Well, I think, um, number one, the energy from oil and gas has brought, uh, brought us out of, uh, brought the standard of living up for so many people and improved the standard of living because it's energy, right? Because we're not having to cook with wood, or we're not having to light our homes with oil or, or uh, well oil or whatever. So we've really improved our standard of living. We're allowed to have, uh, you know, refrigeration and things like that. So number one, it, 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 it hasn't taken us back. It's moved us out of kind of the dark ages. So it is a blessing, not a curse. And that's the first thing you got to identify. And then the question is, is, is what, what is, why do people um, dislike it or why is it, it villainized? I'm not exactly sure, but I do think there's a disconnect on how much we use it. And it's, it's in everything we use, everything we, we, we use to make ourselves comfortable and, um, I, I think there's a real disconnect that we're about to be done with it and that we're transitioning away from it. And if people will get more comfortable with it's, you know, whether it's 80% of our total energy um, or if it's 78% or 82%, you can hear different arguments and focus on what, what parts that you don't like and focus on cleaning that up. If, you're, if your concern is emissions, boy, we come a long way um, with exhaust and efficiencies, efficiencies um, exhaust. From an LED bulb to your vehicle, right. our, our efficiency levels. Right. And um, we're learning how to use, I mean, the best invention, I think, for the environment and using uh, hydrocarbons in our life has been the catalytic converter. Came around in the late 70s, became standard practice in the 80s. And for those of you, that's that's the filtration unit on your gasoline automobile right before your muffler. Okay? And it's it's done wonders for cleaning up our air. In places like Los Angeles, it used to have 
hundreds of days a year of, of smog and pollution since that technology has come into place. They've added more car, more gasoline automobiles, and there's fewer and fewer smog days and the air is cleaner, et cetera. So that's just one example. <clears throat> but on a broad stroke, just stay broad strokes here, one of the first things I remember, this is 1982, one of the first things I learned in college was the population of the earth. And we, we yeah. it was about to turn 4 billion. Yeah. This is in my <laughs> lifetime when I got to college. Here we are, less than 40, well, 40 years later, mm-hmm. and it's double that. We're knocking on 8 billion human beings. Right. And you're a global guy. You, you're right. around. So, so not only is there twice as many people from 1980... Right. You have countries wanting to improve their living. Right. So I guess right. that's a that's a long way to say the demand has grown right. incredibly. Right. I mean, the number still today is we still got like 750 million people on this earth that don't have electricity or, you know, their own electricity. Um, there's still something crazy like a billion and a half people that don't have a quote unquote clean cooking fuel. Um, and we've got a, a, a long way to go. And then you start getting into how few people have uh, air conditioning or reliable heat. And so it, the scariest thing is when you start making decisions, when you have a US passport or US social security number or whatever, and you are a blessed sort of top 5% of the world, regardless of where you are in the income bracket in the United States. So you're, you're super, super blessed. And we're starting to tell people they shouldn't do what we did or are doing because of, right. they don't feel right about <laughs> the use of energy. Yeah. yeah emotions so, come into play there. Right, right. So we've got, we've got a long way to go to <clears throat> improve the standard of living of of billions of people. And I think today we're, whatever the numbers, we're close to 9 billion or eight something, whatever. And, and we are fast growing and we're fast growing, not in the developing area. It's really, you know, it's the undeveloped areas where we're getting the population growth and where they need energy the most. So, so, um, uh, here we go again. They're blaming the oil companies for global warming because the result of burning the fuel is heating the earth up. And so there's there's a lot of movement behind that. So in your travels, right. what is what are the conversations taking place in the Middle East? What's the conversations taking place in South South America? You know, what what's the range of, of attitudes? Well, I, I'm usually around a lot of energy people, um, but I listen and I listen to uh, non-energy people. And I think regardless of if you're in energy, oil and gas, or another kind of renewable energy, and everyone, I've never met anyone that doesn't want to improve the environment because everybody lives here. And I've never, I've never talked or heard or listened to anyone say something along the lines of, I really want to damage the environment or really, you know, I'm I'm really looking forward to polluting or whatever. So everybody's aligned there. I think, uh, I think the confusion is, is this transition deal. And I, I like uh, Daniel Yerger. We talk about him a lot. He wrote the prize and he wrote the new map and and he's one of the best authorities on energy that I know of. And the transition, of whatever the transition is to, and we don't know what that is, by the way, but it's going to be gradual. And the old saying that we went from, uh, you know, we went from wood for about a hundred or thousands of years and went to coal and then from coal to oil Kerosenes. Yeah, kerosenes and and then later different kind of combustible fuels and things like that. And then there's gas, natural gas or methane, and then from methane to LNG 
And to LNG, we don't know what it is next. We don't know if it's hydrogen. Um, there's a lot of talk of, of, of wind and solar, but it's just not moving the needle on both reliability and market share. Okay, a lot of investment and a lot of pro wind and solar, and um, we're not here to talk about what we're for and against. I was just saying, we don't know where we're transitioning. And I think there's a, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's a big rush to transfer to things that are still in research and development and are not reliable and mainstream. And there's a lot of political pressure to try to subsidize, incentivize, mandate into preferred new future energy that's not ready. And what, what I think, the thing that I'm hearing most around the world that everybody agrees with and mo I'm sorry, everybody's the wrong word. Most agree with is anywhere you can clean up your exhaust emissions. Um, Catch it right off the stack. That's right. Catch it. Don't 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 let your pipes leak without you know using that fuel. Don't uh, if you've got a if you got something dirty, scrub it, filter it, clean it, reuse it. If it's carbon, how can you capture it? Not hearing a lot of pushback there. Everybody's pretty much thumbs up on that. The rest of it gets pretty confusing based on the day and who's talking. Right. And so here it becomes a political football that we see. And so let's just talk about some of the renewables, Colby, real quick. So the big ones, uh, you know, when... Uh, you know, we hear a lot of talk about offshore wind. Anybody that's been through the plains of Texas or flew over, any of that, you see just hundreds and thousands of acres full of windmills. Right. Of course, we always had hydropower uh, and, then, and then solar. Um, but let's just talk, Frank. You're talking about we're 80% still right now reliable. I think me and you had a conversation where... I think they had a net gain of 3% over right. the last eight years. Did, didn't uh, Daniel right. talk about that? Well, I, I've heard, yes, Daniel talks about it a lot. There is um, this century, sort of the last, we've just finished 23 years. Um, we're in 2024, but we think there's been about $9.5 trillion spent on renewables to try to transition us away from oil, coal, gas, natural gas. And to the best numbers I've seen, we've gone from maybe our total energy mix from 83% hydrocarbon based to maybe 78 or 80%. And so um, it's unfortunate when I hear people say, you know, uh, hydrocarbons is an important part still of the energy mix. And I'm like, important part. It's 80%. 80%. That's like, I would use a different word than right. important. I'd say right. it's the foundation. It is <laughs> our energy base, right? So <clears throat> anyway, and at the same time, not to, not to get too far off into detailed numbers, but as it's come down with, with unrealistic investment in, in renewables. And when I say unrealistic, it's, 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 uh, it's borrowed money often to build this stuff, but we've still grown, you know, oils, oil had 102 million barrels of global demand last year. Natural gas is growing like crazy and coal still had its best, biggest year ever last year. Coal. Coal did. And everyone tells us that coal's history. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's confusing. I, I, I think we're trying to capture the data but we don't have uh, the math yet to really capture. And I'll, I'll use the example of the solar, the solar sort of uh, packages that we're seeing going up everywhere. And it's about a two foot by four foot sheet, and eighty percent of them are made in China, and, and they're great, and you know whatever. I'm not I'm not anti coal and everything, but if you look at the carbon footprint on coal, I'm sorry, coal, solar, solar. We're talking about solar. These these solar panels 
about 80% of that sort of category is made in China right now. And to make a, a, a silicone wafer sort of uh, panel, you, you need about, I think it's 3,000 degrees Celsius heat. Okay? And we're making that in China. And in China, 67% of the, of the utilities and the electricity and the energy is all coal-related. So... At best, the Solar Institute in the U.S., one of the associations, says, hey, when you put up a solar panel, great. If you're in good sun, great. You're about three years before you're carbon neutral. Yeah, the carbon it took to what, make that. To make that. And then, and, and so that's one, one example. Now, you may say, yeah, well, that's the first three years, but it, it's, it's, it may last. 10 years or whatever. Well, that, that's great, but the technology's changing quicker on that. We're not really there yet on solar. Um, and we're not here, again, we're not here to beat up on solar. No, I use solar, not. you've yeah. used solar. We've Absolutely. got it at our place to run a water well or a fence or whatever, or electric gate or, or whatever. So we're not, we're not anti-solar here. I'm just trying to kind of give everybody an idea. And solar's great in a really sunny area for five to seven hours a day. And there's a lot more time. And we haven't perfected our battery technology, although it is improving. Um, wind's really great. It's just unreliable. And we haven't figured out how to sort of plug in the gaps. And it can go days without I'm going to get you to scoot wind. into the sure. frame a little bit. Yep, yep. Just like come this right. way a little bit and make sure we're good. All right, so which brings us to this. You're a Texas guy. Right. And y'all... Um, Y'all make the news. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, yes. so let's talk about the practicality. And by the way, that's again on the record. Again, I want to keep reiterating. We're in the oil field, but we are pro green energy. We, we have, yeah. we, this is our earth as well. Yes. We want to help solve the problem. Mm-hmm. We're on the service side of the oil field. Right. We service all this stuff, but let's go back to practicality. So explain why y'all always on a razor's edge of having a complete right. blackout in right. Texas every winter. Yeah. So uh, Texas, believe it or not, you know, we're kind of the energy capital of the United States. And some people may argue the world as far as barrels of day of production and, you know, gas and a mate, we had coal, we have everything. But we were early on wind. T. Boone's Pickens said we were going to be the Saudi Arabia of wind energy. And 20-something years ago, we were early to invest. So Texas has almost more wind energy now than the next biggest three states combined. So, you know, there's 35-ish gigawatts in a perfect world with everything blowing just right. Da, 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 da. But by the way, you never get what your wind rating is. That's a different conversation. So we're super big. I think we're the largest growing solar energy group last year. At the same time, we've closed a few thermal dispatchable power plants, which that's that, that means something you can turn on and run when you need it. And that usually means it's natural gas. Sometimes it's coal. And then we've added a lot of electricity demand. So we've, we've put in a lot of investment in renewables, same time, which are very unreliable, and we'll talk about that in a second. Then we've added a lot of demand, and then we've closed some of our reliable, dispatchable power plants. And so what we are today is we've got a, 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 an agency that sort of manages the reliability called ERCOT. And at this point today in our energy mix in Texas, this is embarrassing because we're, we're, we're supposed to be the energy capital of the world. At this point, on the hottest days and the coldest days in Texas, we are weather dependent on our grid to operate. And what does that mean, weather dependent? That means the sun's got to be shining really well and the wind's got to be, be blowing. blowing. <laughs> and if we have a low wind day and a lot of clouds and it's real cold or real hot, we're in trouble. And and what we've started to do is just, we don't do this to grandma and grandpa, and we don't maybe don't do this to the school districts or to a 
maybe a hospital, but the industrial users, we throw the price up five times, 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. Trying to get them to turn their lights To turn on. it down. Get it down. Turn, turn your processing plant down. Turn your factory down. Turn whatever you're doing off if you can. Stop being productive. Just turn the machines off. Send people home. That was a little strong, send people home. But if you can't make anything, you don't need anyone. So that's, that happened six, seven times last summer. It's happened over the winter a couple of times. And, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate. So that's, that's where we are. Uh, our last energy secretary of the United States said, when you get to about 25% renewables in a grid, you lose the ability to sort of manage it at this point with this technology. So... In short, they, we don't have enough grid, and they have no intention on growing the grid. Yeah. We, we don't have enough dispatchable, reliable power And plants. when you say we, the state of Texas. State of Texas. You're speaking for the... Yeah, so that's Texas' problem. It's happened a few other places, but Texas is most notable. Okay, so uh, what have we learned so far? So we all uh, support... Uh, you know, green energy, but what we're saying is the technology uh, just isn't there to move the needle enough to bring back the uh, energy that's uh, sourced through hydrocarbons. Um, on top of that, I, I wanted to touch on this. Uh, if you're an oil company, you're going to drill a, well, a hole in the ground and you're going to get some energy. I, of, of course, oversimplified it. And so you, it, you spend some money uh, to, to mine and to, to, to produce oil and gas. But when you talk about solar and wind, that's a lot of capital, Kobe, that you got to lay out to get your first, mm -hmm. your first little bit of electricity. Mm -hmm. And so... Who has that money and who has the stomach to follow something that's just really not meeting the numbers that right. they want? So right. that's a touchy question. Well, I'll say this. Um, the giant wind and so this is Colby's opinion. Please, uh, please, please look into your own data here. But if you took away the the incentives, mandates, and subsidies, and you put everyone on a playing field, um, you will uh, you won't see many of those mega projects, the solar and wind, and um, that's again that that's that's Colby's opinion. There's good intentions of of why everybody likes those projects, but if you just if the utilities and, and the tax, sorry, the rate payer says, I'm looking for what's the best available technology that is affordable and reliable. That's as clean as possible, but affordable and reliable. Generally, in the, in the, in the world, not necessarily in, in the greatest neighborhoods, in the United States, the most blessed, et cetera. But in the world, it is what is affordable one, reliable to, and anything else is way down the line. And so plain talk, not fun to hear, but that that's the reality. So I, where does nuclear play in all this? Nuclear is fantastic, but kind of like a transmission line, um, you just can't really get anything built. So I, I, I can't explain it. I don't understand it. But nuclear is... Everybody's scared. <clears throat> yeah, it's got, a bad, it's got a PR problem. That's something that was 30 years ago, 50 years ago. It's got a PR problem. And um, it, 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 it hasn't had the investment in the... It, sorry, the, the technology's great. But it hasn't had the investment to build it more efficiently and then get the regulators the politicians, the neighborhood association comfortable with it. No, I get that. Although, I don't know. It just seems a lot more yeah. of a solution than what we're trying right now. So, 
Try to build them. Please don't close them. So what's become clear here is that the bridge to get away from hydrocarbon energy and we'll call it green power, the bridge is much longer. Yeah. We don't know how long of a time. I mean, people are trying to do something before 2030. No way. 2050. 2050 yeah. We might be coming up with a, a combination and mixture of it. But we're kidding ourselves if we don't think it's going to take at least that long with our known technology. Right. I mean, if, if you're looking at history and you're looking at our progress and the old saying, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. Right. It's a hundred years. Wow. Of... <laughs> And now maybe someone invents some amazing la 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 this oxygen you know something. oxygen fusion you know that, but you know it's taken us <clears throat> 150 years to build this electric grid and you know we've investing we've invested a lot in it and um, to 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 change it and replace it. Uh, e even if you had the perfect new technology that I, I, I have no idea what that'd be, boy, it's going to take a while. So let's, let's just talk as two human beings sharing the same earth right now. Right, right. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk that. Okay. I want to feel better. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I want my, we both want our great, great grandchildren to live in a right. wonderful, clean environment. What do we need to do to make everybody feel better and to make us sort of turn the yeah. turn the clock or turn it to where we're improving the atmosphere of the earth versus hurting it? And so now we're talking about what's on the table with uh, carbon net zero, carbon capture. Mm -hmm. Let, let's kind of, for the audience, let's generally explain what's going on in that industry and what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, you know, I think Bob, you and, and me and, and many, many others, we've, we've made, uh, our living around how do we clean up and do things as clean and as safe as possible. Correct. So, you know, you focus on the things you can help on and, and don't get too hung up on, on what doesn't exist yet. Okay. So again, my thoughts are what, what can you do to help the environment? You know, are you, uh, running a, a, a tractor without a catalytic converter or a truck or whatever, whatever you're doing, can you, can you filter what you've got? But the simplest thing is to not litter, you know? Yeah. You know, that's one of my pet peeves. I, oh, I mean, I know it is. You know, people always, man, I, you know, no plastic straws or, you know, don't use any uh, this or whatever. But, you know, only, only multi-use glass or whatever. But if we could just start with, you know, Recycling may not be the answer to everything, but could we could we at least agree to not throw our trash out the window into the ditch that then goes into the creek, the river, and okay. ends up in the ocean on our beach or whatever? So do, do what you can do, and um, you know, um, if, if if you're you know, landfill processes are good; they work well. Your heart may be in recycling because you were taught that, but it's more important to get your waste into the best available technology, into controlled. a processing plant, controlled, into a landfill. That's a recycling system itself, by the way. We repurpose landfills and do amazing things from, you know, commercial complexes to golf courses to whatever else. So use best technology available today. That to me is the best way to help the environment. You know, you know, we we're we're clearly not ready for all electric everything, but you know, nothing wrong with some hybrid for a while, right? That's correct. On an industrial standpoint, how are they coming with uh, carbon capture 
and we going in the wells, we turning it into alternative fuel and all. I know they they running hard at that. Right. Uh, you, can you speak on any of that? Well, I think they're developing the technology. They can do it. They've proven it to capture carbon, whether it's from an industrial site or direct air. That has been proven, and it is working and happening. There's no economics around it, though. There's just, you know, you're just laboratory at this point going, yes, I can make this, but there's no buyer and there's no feeling. But but give it time. It, it, it is being invested in heavily. Um, and, and, you know, remember, uh, carbon is a natural process. You know, you and I read that carbon carbon, animals whatever you know and there's also natural processes of of trees that take carbon out and etc we we can go all through that but what you don't what you see going on right now is the just the irrational excitement exuberance of let me cut down all these trees and put some solar panels up yeah that's you probably right first three to five years we've lost grant Right. Maybe longer. And we don't really have that math yet to know what we're doing. So, again, <clears throat> I know solar and wind's a feel good, but just be gentle. Look, there's there's eight to nine billion people on this earth. Um, that's pretty high concentration. That's not going to change, in my opinion. I hope not. Um, and uh, just just walk with as light a footstep as you can. But but don't be ashamed if you're if if you added uh, you know if if you're in West Africa or Southern India and you got your first mini split air condition added onto the side of your your uh, your concrete or mud hut, well that's okay, right? You know, good for you. Yeah, no, I hear that. Um, and you know when when it's when you talk about net zero, say for example you run a, a whatever plant and you pumping out mm-hmm. let's call it 10 i'm making this up uh, a lot 10, thousand tons of yeah. something well then we're saying hey you need to you need to buy this company over here mm-hmm. who is actually taking carbon out of the air and uh cleaning it up and then putting it down hole or whatever and that's what they call net zero right and so i think that I'm speaking as a human on mm-hmm. the earth. I would love to see technology go to where we can clean, ha- put our air filters out there to, to recapture the carbon. I think that it, you mentioned the catalytic converter. Let's yeah. let's grab yeah. it right at the tip of the stack and treat it. Let's cut off the pollution yeah. and all of us be better stewards. I think we can start measuring that uh, before we just thinking that wind and solar is going to solve all this problems right. and everything's going to go away. Right. It, it, isn't that a more realistic I, I think outlook? So, I think so. I think you, you've, um, you've got to, again, what is available? And sometimes I know people don't want to hear this, but you've got to be patient for the technology. Yes. Best in class. There's, there's, there's unabated coal fired, power plants, there's abated, there's cleaner, there's older, there's unupdated, there's there's all kinds of things you can do to improve whether you're making cement, asphalt, glass, fertilizer, we can go on and on and on. Uh, you're making chemicals, paints, whatever. Generally, everything has some kind of heat source and, and there's exhaust. So where you can scrub it, but on the carbon capturing side, um, or whatever, you know, direct air carbon capturing, you know, today, uh, it, it's, again, it's not really... We're not there. We're yet. not there yet. And, and look, just, if, if people can be patient, the first catalytic converter was probably an unimaginable amount of money. And before long, it's affordable, yeah, and you don't even notice. Yeah, exactly. So, um Look, when when the first plasma flat screen forty two inch TV came out, I think it was ten to fifteen thousand, and and nowadays you can go pick one up for two hundred dollars. Yeah. Well, they brought in LED and things. Oh, like whatever. That. Yeah. So yeah, it so it, it, is... it will it will get there. Um, 
And again, just uh, ever if if you know, we probably got a bigger problem in the world not on the temperature going up a little bit, but with anxiety. Yes. And if everybody could, yes, chill out a little bit, work through it. Um, you know what? Whatever. Educate yourself on it. Yes. You, you know that's that's one thing that you know one of the reasons I want to have you on the podcast is that. You're a data guy. Yeah. You know, you look at data, look at what it, what it is. Don't listen to someone's opinion. Look at the data. I, I'll speak for my experience in the oil field. I mean, when I first got into the oil field, they was, they was dumping drilling mud over the side of the boat on their way in. And yeah. so, so since then, nothing hits the water. It's all containerized. You know, our services provide that same way with safety and lifting devices and, and, and engineering and those things. But one thing that all all companies do, I got to say in their defense, is they abide by the rules. They when, when they say zero overboard, they mean if a drop goes in, you're gonna a lot happens, yeah. and um, and so so I, I I have to come to their defense in that they are phenomenal stewards we're in the 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 the, the, the deserts and the flatlands of uh texas and when they plug and abandon a well you know part of our service is to to make sure it's plugged right go down deep and return sure. it turn it to tumbleweed yeah uh and and they're they very strict on themselves and they're highly regulated so i think all in all they do they do really well with that. Uh, we understand everybody's anxiety, right? Yeah. No, nobody yeah. wants a heated earth and in, in, in melting ice. Caps. No, that's right. And 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 look, I uh, I'm concerned about some of the data, the impression, and and the uh, the the victim or the bad guy or whatever. But look, this is Colby's opinion. Um, I. I've grown up in East Texas around pulp and paper, oil and gas, all that. And I've been to family reunions with my cousins from Colorado and everybody else. And I have a styrofoam cup and they have a paper cup for their coffee or their lemonade or whatever. And if I go show you, and I, I like pulp and paper. If you take anything away, I'm not knocking the pulp and paper people. Okay. They're wonderful. But if I took you through this process of making that paper cup, and I took you through the process of making the styrofoam cup, good point. Uh, you will kiss that styrofoam cup. Um, if you go see a clear cut forest, a pulp and paper plant. By the way, in, that, in a well site. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit well site, a really uh, clean polymer plant that I live not far from where they make styrofoam. You would, you would have a different impression. So it's very, a lot of the transition and feel good environmental, it's very last mile. Just like some of the mining facilities I've seen in Africa that are going Those for- Those are terrible, oh, man. Listen, for, for, they hide that footage. Yeah, nobody wants to see the battery exotic metals and the processing of all that. So anyway, you might like that hybrid car a little more or whatever. But anyway, let's let's go back to uh, you know, careful with the data. And by the way, a lot of the folks that are predicting doom and gloom, take a look at their track record the last thirty or forty years. Okay, it's it's real hard to model, right? Real hard to model, and they're good intentions. But again, if everybody could lower their anxiety, we're gonna be okay. Um, our country is cleaner than it was, and we've added a lot of gasoline automobiles. We've added a lot of industrial production, especially in Texas. Um, and it's better than it was from a standpoint of water, air, and soil pollution over the last 30 years or 40 years. So let's bring down that anxiety a little bit. We're going to be okay. Technology is going to improve. And trust in someone higher. Yes. And look, thank God for regulation groups. I mean, I remember when I first started in the oil field, there was pipeline leaks everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was there was just a lot of a lot of 
clean up or even non-clean up. And uh, look, we've come a long way. And that's that's one thing about this country is, uh, you know, we hold each other accountable and thank God for the ones holding uh, everyone accountable out there because we all share the same planet. But, you know, energy is something we all love and like, and it makes our lives a heck of a lot better. But, um, you know, I wish I wish we can all live off of the wind and the sun, and maybe one day our great-grandchildren will. But uh, in the meantime, I think the solutions are uh, within in hand. It's just going to take a little bit longer, and we just have to be work as a whole. Absolutely. Thank you, What you think, man? I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> couldn't agree more. Well, uh, thanks for coming by, Kobe. I thanks. know uh, next time we'll talk about something a little <laughs> bit more <laughs> fun, fun than energy. But uh, um, any uh, any suggestions for anyone listening to as far as for books or articles or a way to educate themselves? I mean, anything you could suggest? Well, I, I think read as much as you can. Um, I think history tells us as much yeah, that's true as as predictions in the future and um you know look at the true data and you know again you know i think one of the best books lately i've seen is is the new map and you know that that will help a lot on energy mm-hmm. and it's not someone that's voting one way just given given some good opinions so that's the 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 one that most recently, and then you can go back to the prize, and that'll bring you all the way to sort of 1993 and 93 on the new map. But that's my recommendation. Uh, again, uh, in, enjoy this earth, and enjoy your life and your gifts, and just uh, throw away your trash in the right. in the can. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kobe Crenshaw. Remember, uh, get the app. Go to the app store. Type in Cafe Detente, and uh, it's going to bring you to our newspaper, the Cafe Chronicles. Uh, Kind of a slow start right now, but jump on it. We've got a lot of new tiles and a lot of people coming in. Got a lot of neat neat things happening. Stay tuned. And uh, Kobe, thanks for coming by. We'll talk soon. All right. Enjoy that coffee. All right.